<laughs> well, good afternoon, everyone, and uh, thanks for being here. Last week, I talked about my concern that halfway through the session, neither body in the legislature has passed the housing bill. Even though most would agree, we have a housing crisis. This week, the House is set to pass H-687, a conservation bill that, in my opinion, will actually make it harder to build housing in most areas of the state. Also this week, House Appropriations is trying to figure out how to fill a gap they created in the BAA. And it looks like housing investments could be on the list of cuts. If that turns out to be the case, then maybe they're saying housing isn't the crisis they campaigned on. But housing isn't our only challenge. So this week I wanted to uh, talk a little bit about affordability and give an update, particularly with the Clean Heat Standard implemented after they overrode my veto last year in the Renewable Energy Standard Bill that will be considered this week in the House. Before we dive into the details of these bills, both of which will add significant costs on Vermonters, it's important to think about them in the context of all of the other added costs Vermonters face, everything in the aggregate. In addition to cuts to housing and other investments, the House is also talking about raising taxes which I don't think will be a surprise to many Vermonters, unfortunately. But here are a few things to think about. First, two and a half months ago, I proposed a balanced budget, which grew at 3.57%. Funded programs and services made new investments in priorities like housing, public safety, and flood recovery without raising taxes or fees. Second, while trying to raise taxes is nothing new for the legislature, unlike last year, they're not talking about raising taxes and fees for a new benefit. They're talking about raising them to fill budget gaps they created after overspending last year. We're already one of the highest tax states in the nation, and any tax on businesses will be passed on to consumers, which at the end of the day will hit everyday Vermonters. And let's not forget, Vermonters are also about to face a historic property tax increase, all while people and businesses are paying 20% more at the DMV this year. And on July 1, Vermonters will be hit with a new $100 million payroll tax. As a reminder, both of these increases I vetoed that were overridden. On top of that, in the not too distant future, Vermonters could pay hundreds or thousands of dollars more per year to heat their homes with the clean heat standard. I continue to be concerned about the impact this will have on everyone, but especially low income and rural Vermonters. So when my veto was overridden, I said we'd keep Vermonters informed on the process. Mr. Tierney will provide an update in a couple of minutes. She'll also talk about the Renewable Energy Standard Bill that's moving through the House this week, which could cost ratepayers hundreds of millions over the next 10 years. And while we share the goal of using more renewable energy and reducing emissions, it doesn't mean there's an open checkbook. Our Public Service Department spent 18 months engaging directly with Vermonters and crafting a plan that would actually get us there faster, at lower costs, and in a more equitable way than the House bill. Unfortunately, all that work was ignored, and their proposal was instead written by the utilities, lobbyists, and special interests. Vermonters can't afford to put theory and good intentions over practical solutions. We're seeing that firsthand with the clean heat standard, and they should learn from it and take the time to get the renewable energy bill right so it's actually feasible and affordable. So with that, I'll turn it over to Commissioner Tierney for those updates. Thank you, Governor. Um, good afternoon, Commissioner Tierney for the Department of Public Service. 
Updating the Vermont Renewable Energy Standard has been the focus of much discussion this legislative session. And as you may recall, as the governor just noted a moment ago, uh, the Department of Public Service proposed a path that was developed by closely engaging with Vermonters themselves, who told us the number one priority in securing their clean renewable energy future should be affordability. The department's path would move all Vermont utilities to 100% energy that is free of carbon emissions by 2030. But to date, the department's proposal has been set aside in favor of H-289. Both the House Committee on Environment and Energy and House Appropriations devoted a lot of time to crafting and reviewing H-289. I want to acknowledge that work, even if I do not share the view that H-289 is the preferable path to getting where we agree Vermont needs to go. 100% carbon-free energy in the near future. Vermonters want to do the right thing to combat climate change, but in a way they can afford. H-289, as presently drafted, does not meet that standard, not when the department has a proposal on the table that is more aff affordable following 18 months of talking to Vermonters about what they want their energy policy to look like. As we consider the costs of updating the Renewable Energy Standard in 2024, we need to keep in mind that these costs would come on top of the costs Vermonters are already paying for the existing Renewable Energy Standard that became law in 2015. In this year's annual energy report, the Public Service Department reported that the costs of the 2015 standard for just one year, 2022, were approximately 15 million, and that the net present value of the future costs for just the 2015 standard will fall in the range of 107 million to 280 million over the next 10 years. So again, the cost for two H289 would be on top of the costs for the 2015 standard that is already law in Vermont. Now, the Joint Fiscal Office has also spent a lot of time this session estimating the potential cost impacts of H-289. And I hold the work of JFO in high regard, even if I can't agree with all of their conclusions. The department has reviewed both the first fiscal note and the revised fiscal note, and has audited the JFO's testimony about H-289 costs estimated before House appropriations. Still. The department remains firm in its assessment that the JFO's range of estimated costs is too low. This too low estimate is understandable, given that JFO qualified its analysis at page eight of the revised H-289 fiscal note. JFO said there remain five substantial, I quote, topics that are worthy of consideration but require more time to study. And I agree with that assessment. Here are some of the more specific reasons why the JFO's H-289 cost estimates seem too low to the department. On the power supply side, the JFO's revised fiscal note concludes that H-289 will result in significant costs to Vermonters, about 150 to 250 million from implementation through the year 2035. For reference, the estimated cost of the department's proposal is 110 million for that period. Now, Neither the JFO estimates nor the department's estimate captures what res updated costs will be to Vermonters beyond the year 2035. But there will be such costs, they are in law if this law passes, and the costs beyond 2035 will be significant. They will be additional to what Vermonters are paying now, and as yet, these additional costs remain unquantified and unaccounted for in the estimates we have so far. On the transmission side, the revised fiscal note nominally states the low end of the cost range is zero. But then on page six, frankly concedes that there actually are likely to be costs. Moreover, H-289's approach to speeding up more in-state renewable energy depends heavily on optimal siting, an issue that is notoriously hard fought in our state, especially in many of the very places and communities where this optimal siding would need to occur if the JFO's low cost estimates of H-289 are going to translate to reality when implemented. 
And even if we assume no transmission in infrastructure costs owing to an RES update, we would need to deploy alternatives to building transmission infrastructure, such as load management, storage, and curtailing generation. These alternatives are also costly and represent additional money Vermonters will have to pay toward the renewable energy transition. Nor do the GF JFO cost estimates for H-289 include carrying costs for the transmission and distribution investments that will be necessitated by H-289. What are such carrying costs? It's like when you build and finance an addition to your house. You pay interest on the construction and you pay more tax on the property value you've added to your house. In the world of transmission and distribution investment, an example of a carrying cost is the additional money ratepayers will pay in rates to utilities to invest capital in the transmission and distribution needs resulting from H-289. Now, we will no doubt continue to debate exactly what the best estimated cost of 289 is, but the bigger point is what matters, and that should inform our policy judgment. The bigger point is what Vermonters need to know their government is paying attention to. Mm -hmm. The bigger point is that by any measure, any estimate, the total costs of Vermont's investment in renewable energy, current and future, is sizable, material, and therefore must be managed at a pace that is affordable for Vermonters. Again, H-289, as presently drafted, does not meet this standard. Certainly not when the department's 110 million cost estimate is still on the table, as that is clearly more affordable. And certainly not when the JFO tells us there is more information worthy of consideration if they just had more time to study it. The many estimates we have on the cost of 289 and PSD's proposals are just that in the end, they're estimates. Directionally, the differences between the two proposals are clear. The PSD's proposal comes at an estimated cost above business as usual of 110 million over the next 10 years, while H-289's costs could easily exceed 500 million for that same period. The two proposals are exactly the same when it comes to the emission reductions required by the Global Warming Solutions Act by 2035, although the department's proposal gets to carbon-free by 2030, which is five years ahead of 289. And I emphasize only the department's proposal and estimates come following substantial public engagement consistent with the spirit of Act 154, which the legislature invested considerable time and effort in last year in passing. Passing H-289 adds cost, complexity, and risk with little additional benefit to Vermonters. The PSD's proposal offers a path toward achieving 100% clean energy with straightforward recognition of utility power supply resources and investments, manageable increases in rates that won't thwart electrification, and a structure to embrace community benefits and needs. The department's proposal will also result in building significant and necessary in-state renewables when and where they are needed to optimize the significant grid investment Vermonters have already made while leaving resources to support other resilience and decarbonization initiatives and the extensive orchestration needs of the emerging modern grid. We need to remember that Vermont's greenhouse gas emissions are overwhelmingly concentrated in the thermal and transportation sectors. How we stay mobile, how we stay warm. Vermont needs to electrify these sectors to do what we need to keep the rates of our renewable electricity as low as we can so that folks won't shy away from switching to electricity. To fight climate change, we need folks to switch to heat pumps, but that is a very hard sell when considered side by side with the many other cost of living increases Vermonters are now facing as we speak, whether at the pump or at the grocery store or at the doctor's office or at town hall when paying property taxes. In fighting climate change, Vermonters simply cannot afford government policies that fail to heed their clearly expressed priority, which is affordability. Now turning to the clean heat standard update that the governor promised you, here's what I can report. You no doubt recall, as the governor said from last year's session, that the administration expressed deep concerns about passing a law that set Vermont on a course to create a clean heat standard with so much still unknown about the hit Vermonters inevitably will take to their wallets. 
the General Assembly nonetheless passed such a bill, and the Public Utility Commission is now hard at work in designing a rule that will come back to the legislature for review and a vote. The work before the PUC on the clean heat standard is moving at a swift pace under pressure of statutory deadlines that are challenging and, in one important instance at least, have proved demonstrably unworkable. By that I mean the requirement to appoint a default delivery agent before getting the results of the potentiality study that will materially define the scope of the work of that agent. I want to express my gratitude to the Senate Natural Resources Committee for its responsiveness in passing out S-305 when this particular problem was brought to their attention a few weeks ago. Designing a regulated market for fuel providers when those entities have never been regulated in this manner before is, to say the least, complicated. And Vermonters have a lot riding on the PUC getting it right. Consider, for instance, the cost implications that attach to developing clean heat credit values or emissions reduction pacing for fuel providers, not to mention default delivery agent costs, as well as an estimated measure mix, a technical and program potential study, and other details. Nearly every organization that has commented in the Commission's proceedings about process and scheduling has indicated that this combination of complexity and procedural pace is challenging their ability to contribute their best thinking. In turn, the PUC has been doing all it can to meet the statutory deadlines that have been imposed for developing a draft clean heat standard by rule by January 2025. Still, these comments from participants are cause for concern because most of us know from our own life experience that haste makes waste. And with that, Governor, I turn this back to you. Once I get all my papers together. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, we'll now open up to questions. Governor, the plan you're talking about, is that the 2022 Comprehensive Energy Plan? What that even Commissioner Cherry referred to is this would be better. Yeah. It's the renewable energy <laughs> standard. No, but that was a good question. The, what we're talking about is an actual legislative proposal we made this year. And I might add that that proposal is consistent with what we laid out in the Comprehensive Energy Plan, where the department and the Scott administration called for 100% renewable by 2030, I think. Is it where 30 or 25? 30 What's or the name 35? Of the, what's the, name of? the Comprehensive Energy Plan, do we call for 100% by 2030 or 2035? Uh, we call it, the Comprehensive Energy Plan called for consideration by 2030. Thank you. What's the name of that proposal that you put forward, legislative proposal? I would say it's the RES reform proposal from the department, renewable energy standard proposal. Well, thank you all. <laughs> this is a question for, for the commissioner, maybe TJ as well. How much of our, our carbon emissions actually come from um, non-renewable energy. You mentioned it was mostly, um, like how, how big of a, a dent will this make in our Global Warming Solutions Act requirements? Uh, sure, uh, TJ Poor, Director of Planning at the Public Service Department. Uh, the electric sector is a really small share of our Global Warming Solutions Act uh, emissions, accounted for emissions. The thermal and transportation uh, sectors are overwhelmingly uh, the majority of the emissions or re responsible for the majority of emissions. Uh, I don't have the exact number off the top of my head, but I believe it's less than 5% uh, right now come from the electric sector as accounted for by GWSA. You also talk about the impact on rate payers. I mean, like, what would this mean for your electric bill? Like, what, 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 what's the cost of that? Well, yeah, it's it's um, it's a challenge to kind of have these big numbers, right? The 500 million, 150 to 450 million, whichever whichever one is your preference, and translate those to electric bills. Those are net present value numbers. So it takes the stream of um, of impacts in each year and discounts them for the time value of money. But rate impacts are actually account for the actual dollars associated with uh, associated with um, each year uh, of impact, and you know, our our we reported last year that our current renewable energy standard over the next ten years was estimated to be, as the commissioner said, uh, 107 to 280 million dollars for our current 
standard, that, and those are net present value terms, that equates to less than 1% uh, to uh, a little under 5% rate impact as an average over the 10 years. So. Governor, something I've been hearing from uh, senators and, and others is that we need to reduce these emissions, we need to reach these goals in order to reduce climate-caused damage, mitigate damage. Uh, is there a connection between what we do here in Vermont and in terms of reducing our emissions and reducing the, the, the damage caused by climate change? I think we have to um, to accept uh, the mm -hmm. fact that climate change, I believe, is real, um, that uh, carbon emitting fuels is the culprit, and then we have to do everything we can to reduce those emissions. Um, but if you're asking me whether Vermont on its own can, can do this and turn it around in a short period of time, I'd say no. Um, we're just one small piece of this very, very large puzzle. And uh, as well, this is just, it's not instantaneous. It's going to take some time for this to take place and in, in probably decades before we'll see any effect of what we're doing today. But it doesn't mean we don't do anything. We have to do something. Um, but, um, but to take it on all at once without considering the affordability and, and the impact on Vermonters, I think, uh, is, is, uh, is, is not acceptable. I, I think we have to consider that. Anything else you want to add? There's a proposal also to create a climate super fund allowing the state to sue fossil fuel producers. I know you've been asked about it before. Where, what's your thinking on that, that bill? You know, I've, I've commented a few times on this, and um, creating a fund is one thing. Suing um, the big oil, so to speak is a daunting challenge. Probably a better question for the Attorney General. Um, but, um, but I would say this is not instantaneous either. This will take years, if not decades, uh, to see through. I, I wouldn't look for this uh, to be the solution uh, to some of our, our financial uh, issues. Not anytime soon. Would you still sign? Secretary Moore, would you like to comment on that? Sure. Maybe just a little bit. Which is just to note, um, we in, in spent a considerable amount of time in Senate Judiciary, which was working on S-259, um, and encouraged them to look at the resilience implementation strategy that the governor on behalf of ANR and the treasurer had announced work on back in January, which will start to actually estimate the costs necessary um, to invest to have landscape level resilience. We don't have that number right now. Uh, there's also concerns about how we would estimate some of the fuel volume calculations that are included in that bill. Um, I think in concept, it is a, a really interesting approach. Um, the governor's right, this is going to take a considerable amount of time and likely to face a considerable amount of legal challenge and resistance. Um, but there are pieces of that that are in motion um, and other pieces of it that we think foundational pieces of that effort that need more work right now. In its present form? Yeah. Probably not. Are you concerned about the short term costs of legal challenges and having to defend the state in the court around this? Well, again, I think it's a better question for the Attorney General. I don't know what their forecast is, how much they would um, estimate that it would cost to, to mount a challenge on our own. I would, I prefer myself to let some other big states lead the charge on this, like California and New York. They have all kinds of resources and all kinds of money that we don't have, and uh, let them take the lead. A couple of weeks ago, you talked about school consolidation and the difficulty in having local schools make that decision because they almost always say no, and you suggested that perhaps the state could play a larger role in determining consolidation. Is that a fair assessment? Yeah, I would, I would say so. I mean, there's, there's all kinds of ways to do that. Uh, I think I also, I don't know if I mentioned this or not, but uh, 
but when I was in the Senate at the time that we put the moratorium on school construction, for instance, uh, in that legislation, though, in that capital bill, we put a provision uh, for funding if you would consolidate. Uh, no one took us up on that offer, as I recall, uh, but that could be on the table as well. If you're willing to consolidate and uh, bring these schools together, particularly uh, high schools, um, that we could participate in a higher level for school construction, and which is something that I believe uh, a lot of them need. But, but bringing them together and providing that carrot incentive, I think, would be uh, what I'm talking about. You're not talking about any sticks? Well, there's always sticks, but I, mean, I would much rather the carrot approach. I mean, that hasn't worked, right? I well, mean, I don't know. I mean, we're at a much different time at this, at this point. I mean, you, you look at all the schools. I mean, you've, I've used this for an example before. Uh, we have Montpelier High School. We have U32, what, four miles away. Uh, we have Northfield High School. Uh, we have Spalding, um, all within a stone's throw of each other. And, um, and it just seems to me there's a better way of doing it. When I was, uh, when I was in high school, uh, Montpelier High School was a Division I school. Today, I, I think there may be Division Three. I, I don't know if they have a football team or a hockey team or anything like that. I mean, they, the, the number of students that we're losing out of these schools is dramatic. So we've got to find a better way. And we have to find a way, uh, not just for, from a cost standpoint, but for the quality of education and the opportunity for kids. That seems to be always lost. I mean, we've, we've spent, if you look back maybe um, 10 years uh, or so, uh, when I first came into office, or maybe a little bit before, I think we were about $1.5 billion we were spending for education, which was, that I thought was significant. That had increased dramatically over 10 years. But now we're spending almost a billion dollars more than that. This is unsustainable, and we have to find ways to reduce those costs and give the, the kids the education they deserve and need. Chris, I see you there, but it looks like you're still uh, muted. All right, we'll try Keith, Rutland Harold. Hi, uh, so I was talking to some homeless shelter providers and advocates about what happened over the weekend with the GA program. According to them, they could have gone a little smoother with some better communication, but um, I was wondering why your administration kind of learned from that whole scene and what you might do differently in the future, if anything. I don't know what, you're, what you heard about it. Well, again, I think uh, from a planning perspective, it went fairly well. Um, we, uh, in a matter of uh, two to three weeks, we were able to put together four emergency shelters, congregate shelters, uh, with enough cots in, in an area with mostly um, buildings that were, were state-owned, I think, um, showed that we, we set this up with EMTs and, and uh, had some oversight uh, with the help of the National Guard, uh, as well as with uh, folks from the AHS, and uh, to, to make sure that we're keeping people safe, at least overnight, as we tra transition uh, during this, uh, this inclement weather period. So um, from that perspective, I think, uh, I think we did we did a good job. Emergency management led the charge on this, and, and I think it, uh, it was worthwhile. Um, we didn't receive uh, a lot of intake as a result uh, in the single, single numbers in, in uh, Rutland and, and here in Berlin. Um, in fact, I think it was like three nights of zero here in Berlin, um, three nights of zero in Brattleboro, um, maybe up to seven or eight in Rutland. And then the most uh, was in uh, the increase. We, I think in the first night, it might have been uh, probably six or seven in Burlington, uh, but it's increased to maybe 26 last night. Um, so um, we, we know, uh, and that was probably in Burlington as a result of their shutting down their shelter, um, closing that facility 
on Sunday night. So that most of those who were in the, participated in the Hotel Moto program weren't the ones who um, we had in the, uh, the Burlington uh, facility. So in terms of uh, communication, uh, obviously I know that there was some concern over that, uh, but uh, what we were trying to do is help those communities. We didn't know what to expect when we first arrived at this, uh, this situation where we knew from a seasonal standpoint that we were going to go to the inclement weather provision, uh, which would mean somewhere between four and 500 people who would be uh, not uh, eligible for the program, the GA program. Another 12 to 1,500 are still there, by the way. Um, so some, some uh, thought that we were, all of them uh, were exiting the program, but that wasn't the case. Uh, those, uh, the most elderly, those who disabled, um, and those families uh, were still in the program. These were most, mostly single um, adults uh, who have, were of working age and, and eligible to work. So in that regard, we didn't know what to expect, so we had to plan ahead. And, um, and, and or we felt we had to, to plan ahead. We didn't have to do anything. Under a normal transition from the general assistance program, uh, nothing would be provided for uh, sheltering beyond the hotel motel program. It would all be just triggered by uh, inclement weather. But we thought it was best to do that to protect the communities because we didn't want to see 100 to 150 people out on the streets, sleeping on the sidewalks, in downtown Rutland or Burlington or Brattleboro or Bennington or Barrie or Montpelier. And so we just, um, we activated um, to, uh, to make sure that didn't happen and we were able to protect people. Uh, in the end, I think um, it all seemed to work out. Uh, there were no real incidents uh, that I'm aware of. And um, so I think it was a, a successful mission from that standpoint, uh, but we still have a homeless population uh, that uh, that is still there, and we need more housing and more emergency uh, emergency shelters, homeless shelters, uh, in order to provide for them in the future. And unfortunately, the uh, legislature um, took four million away from us out of the Budget Adjustment Act that we were going to use for homeless shelters, uh, and we're engaging with VACB to see what their plans are uh, accordingly. So. We know we need more housing. Uh, that's what I keep harping on. And, uh, but we need more of all, from all aspects, whether it's uh, homeless shelters, emergency shelters, um, low income housing, middle income housing, housing throughout. So that's going to be, continue to be my focus. I asked some, um, <laughs> no, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, sorry, D does anyone know if there was a reason? My understanding was they, they had to go to one of these shelters to fill out this form to get screened for disability if they came in under the cold weather rule. But does anybody know why that just couldn't have been done where they were in their rooms at the hotel? Is there, I don't know about the logistics of it, but. Yeah, I, I believe, I mean, we talked about that and I believe that they were uh, as best they could, um, but I'll let uh, Secretary Samuelson react to that. You're on mute, um, Jenny. Thank you. I do, uh, thank you, Governor, and I, I do wanna reinforce um, that we, we were actively um, communicating, uh, going door to door um, in the hotels last week, um, providing the waivers, um, and for those who we didn't meet, we're putting it under their door, um, communicating them with them with mail, and also uh, talking with the service providers who've been an integral part of this. When it comes to those who have a waiver form, that, those steps were critical. An individual did not have to um, come to one of the shelters to fill it out. And in fact, the majority didn't. Um, they were able to meet with their own providers um, who attested. They were able to work with local community partners. Um, they were able to work with economic services. And so uh, we've been really flexible in how um, individuals can fill out, uh, fill out that form um, and get it to us. And I, I just want to reinforce it over and over again. And as well, you know, as we've gone door to door, I, you know, one of the things that's critical the governor said is over and over and over again, 
what our clients need is housing. Um, they need a unit and they need a unit that they um, can afford. I think that this has proven that um, in, in spades. Thank you. Tom Davis, Compass Vermont. All right, we'll go to Kevin, seven days. Hi, uh, Governor, can you hear me? We can. So on this question of the homeless shelter, and I just have a broader question for you about whether you agree with the legislature's decision to expand eligibility to include more people with more types of disabilities to be able to stay in motels through June 30th. Did you agree with that? Or was that part of the problem here, is that they tried to broaden the pool of people that would be able to stay? Um. No, I mean that was in the that was in the budget adjustment. I signed the budget adjustment. We knew that going in. Um, I don't know what they're if they're planning something more at this point. Uh, I haven't heard. Um, but uh, in conjunction with that, as we've talked about before, uh, the eighty dollar cap was important uh, in order to accomplish what we needed to accomplish. And um, and I thank the legislature for keeping that in and remaining steadfast in that commitment because as we struggled over the last. Um, two or three weeks before budget adjustment passed, we had uh, our folks uh, working on this day and night, engaging with the hotel owners, and they didn't believe that it was going to happen. They thought, the, to be honest, the legislature was gonna cave once again, because they've done it time and time again over the last three or four years, when we've, or a couple of years, when we've tried to, to transition out of this hotel motel program. So. They were surprised um, and they were holding off, but um, but keeping some of them, keeping an open mind. Some of them said that they wouldn't do it, but they ended up doing it in the end uh, when the legislation passed. So again, it was all a concerted effort um, in combination with a lot of different factors that led to us being able to do this. So we won't be uh, at least expending as much money per night uh, for these hotel rooms, which is, uh, you know, we'll save Maybe not half, but but darn close to, to half of what we were paying before. Okay, well, on the subject of cost, I mean, there are some people who have the impression that the transition here was sort of intentionally made somewhat difficult for people to participate in because it would result in 500 or so fewer people in hotel rooms that the state would have to pay for. Was that part of the motivation for this? No. The management of this transition? Well, the transition, uh, as I said before, we would, didn't have to do anything. We didn't have to provide any emergency shelter, sheltering uh, for these folks transitioning out of this program that were no longer um, eligible for the GA program. So this was known, it was known by legislators, this was no surprise. But what may have surprised them was us creating an opportunity over a seven day period to transition a little bit further, maybe a little bit of a glide slope here uh, for some because we didn't know what was going to happen. But again, I'm, I'm pleased that it wasn't a, a mass uh, amount of people who needed to be sheltered, it seems as though. And we, we kept in contact as well as this was a a combined effort uh, amongst many different agencies and departments and public safety kept in contact with uh, the localities to make see if there was any uh, increase in the amount of people they were seeing out on the streets and so forth as a result of this. And the report back, at least to me, was that there was no increase, no impact uh, that they, they saw. So it appears that everyone had a plan and was able to do something different and maybe uh, they did receive that and, and made other arrangements for housing. Thanks. Can I change the subject briefly? Yep. I just got back from New York City where I toured an overdose prevention site in uh, Harlem and uh, wrote a story about it in seven days today. And um, I was wondering, do you intend or would you be open to having members of your administration tour that site before you uh, entertain signing a bill about overdose prevention sites in the state of Vermont? Um, I am assuming our Agency of Human Services uh, would be um, willing to, to look at that facility. Um, I remain 
uh, skeptical of this for a number of different reasons. Uh, take my, my personal uh, views aside, put that aside uh, from a practical standpoint. I mean, we're not, we're not Harlem here in, in Vermont, right? We don't have the density of population that Harlem does. And from my, my pragmatic mind, the way it works is I can't get it through my head how a, a safe injection site let's say in the middle of Burlington, where we know uh, there's an increased need because of xylazine and fentanyl, where people have to shoot up more. And sometimes not even shooting up, they're, they're smoking. And I'm not sure, I mean, there's another pragmatic thing that goes through my mind. Are we gonna allow people who, who smoke um, to, to um, satisfy uh, their, their addiction? And, and, I, and I'm not sure about that. but. Put that aside, and so you have you have density in Burlington, um, and if this is truly just about Burlington, to take people off the streets and get them out of sight, so they aren't uh, on Church Street and in downtown Burlington, I, I can understand it. But if people are thinking that uh, there are going to be those who uh, are addicted, come from Essex or Shelburne or South Burlington or Milton or Ch uh, Colchester to all of a sudden come when, is it open 24 seven, 365, and come drive down into Burlington to shoot up, then we put them on their merry way back home in their vehicle. It just, none of this makes any sense to me. So I, I'm a skeptic uh, at best, and, um, but I, in reaction to your question, I'm sure the Agency of Human Services uh, would be willing to go take a look. Maybe they don't okay. have to. Okay. I'm, sure you, I'm sure your article would give, is going to give great details on that. So they may not, may not have to. One detail in that story is that the uh, overdose prevention sites that operate in New York City do so without state approval. They do so with city approval. And I wonder if uh, you envision well, I will say that the new mayor-elect of Burlington has said that uh, if this is not something that the state signs off on, she will need to explore doing so um, unilaterally for the city. Um, what's your reaction to that? Well, again, I think uh, you probably know the answer to that. I, I uh, vetoed uh, a charter change for Burlington for this purpose, I believe, um, so I'm probably would do the same in this regard. So I'm, I'm just, I don't want to lose sight of the fact uh, that we have a program available now um, that has been working and it's, and it's about uh, treatment and recovery and prevention and enforcement. So we have the four legs of the stool that is, appears to be working. And I don't, I, I, would, I would, would not want us to take you know, any money, significant money in this case, from, from what I've heard, to set up this site um, that would take away from measures that we know works. So for those who say, wouldn't this be worth it if we just saved one life in Burlington? I say, how many, how many are we going to lose as a result of, of decreasing the amount of money they'll, receiving, they'll be receiving for treatment and recovery? So it's a balancing act that I, I'm not willing uh, to go out on the limb on this one. Uh, I believe that uh, what we're doing is working, and until someone proves otherwise, I'll continue to maintain that, that uh, tack. Thanks. Thanks very much. I appreciate it. The last question would be, though, by what metric are you saying things are working? Because overdose deaths are at all-time highs. Well, actually, I, th I believe they're, they're down just a little bit. I know Burlington is down overall statewide. They're down just a little bit. It's not a, a time for celebration, believe me. Um, but, they, um, but over last year, I believe they're down just a bit. We'll see how the numbers work their way out. OK, thanks, Governor. Tim McQuiston, Vermont Business Magazine. All right, we'll try Chris one more time before coming back to the room. All right, back to the room. I'm a 
before. Uh, the Climate Superfund bill is 259. 289 is the Senate's uh, social media age appropriate design bill for children, which they passed unanimously uh, through all stages of passage. Yesterday, have you read the bill? You I have not read the bill. Is it an S bill? It's an S bill, yes. And it's going over to the House at this point? Yes. Yeah. I have not seen it. But it sounds like we have some time to take a look. How do you feel just in general about the concept of compelling big tech to adjust their programming and the addictive coding nature for children? Yeah, I mean, overall, we want to protect our kids. And big tech probably has a role to play in that. So we'll just, the devil's always in the details, though. Ways and Means is also working on um, that, that big Medicaid expansion for, for Dr. Dinosaur, um, pregnant women, uh, really big expansion. Have, have you seen the bill? Or I, I believe we have been working on that as well. And I'll refer to Secretary Samuelson on that to see if she has any input. So we've been working very closely uh, with the committees on that bill, um, and I think particularly to do an assessment of um, the fiscal impact of it and to identify what the, the federal impacts of that bill are. Um, I think some of those are still outstanding, and at this point, I believe it's now uh, more of a study um, than actual implementation for this year. Um, but I, I do think that it that it, if implemented, uh, these major changes, they, uh, we're going to need to have a clear discussion on where that funding comes from. Well, yeah, because Medicaid is an, an infinite amount. Uh, we are under um, pressure to keep it within a certain range, so part of our global commitment. You know, I was wondering, uh, the last couple of weeks you've expressed frustration, I think, with the legislature over housing Act 250 budget pressures. Today we heard about taxes, education spending. Is this kind of, from your experience of the last eight years, business as usual, or is there something different going on this year that there's more of a tension between the legislative and executive branches of government? I think a, a couple of things. Uh, from my perspective, you know, things have changed from a financial standpoint, fiscal standpoint over the last four years. We had all kinds of federal money flowing in the doors. Uh, many of the legislators uh, never have never experienced a downturn. Um, so we're seeing um, many in denial, I believe, in, in terms of the reality that's here right before us. We don't, we simply don't have the money. And without raising taxes and fees further, um, we have to try and live within our means. And, and they seem unwilling to do that. Um, I've heard uh, some who say, you know, it doesn't matter how much we, we have to spend. Uh, we just need to provide these services, and then we're just going to raise taxes to, to fulfill that. And that's just not the way I work, and it's not the way Vermonters, I think, would want us to work. They have to live within their budgets, and we're putting an awful lot of pressure on them. I mean, think about, you know, it's like the perfect storm here, $225 million in uh, property tax or education fund increases, which is going to amount to a, at least a 20% increase in, in property taxes. And on top of that, you know, as I said before, DMV fees increasing. Uh, we're seeing inflation that has skyrocketed over the last three or four years, all of this coming together at one time. And the legislature is still looking at ways to spend more. There's hundreds of millions of dollars worth of proposals out there somewhere where they think they need to, to have them fulfilled. And I know it's going to put a lot of pressure on the appropriations committees at this point, but I don't think there's any more taxing capacity in the state. Uh, we're already the most ex one of the most expensive states in the country. We suffer from a demographic crisis, a housing crisis, and uh, all of it's linked together. And affordability is uh, another factor in that. So who are we going to ask to pay more? And, and I think that the, the issue here is, what's the impact going to be this year? You take a property tax increase, whether you're whether you're renting or you own a home, it doesn't matter. You're still going to feel the impact of this education fund increase, believe me, even renters. So you take that and you take an average uh, cost of a home, uh, maybe 
take something like 250, 300, 300,000, maybe 350, take the median age, and, and then you, you factor that in on top of all the other increase we're seeing and inflation and all the other um, uh, and, uh, areas of, um, of, of pressure, financial pressure. So you, individuals, families are going to have to ask themselves, what are we going to do without this year? We're faced with spending $3,000 more uh, this year on taxes and fees and so forth. What are we going to do without? And it's a stark reality for, for some of the low-income families, middle-income families, our workforce. I mean, what are they going to do? No more summer camp for their kids. What is it that they give up? And I think it's a stark reality. It's, it's time for us to try and live within our means so we can protect them. And I don't see enough of that. Well, what about the three percent sur surcharge on Vermonters who make more than five hundred thousand dollars? Well, again, um, I don't know what impact that will have on them. Uh, maybe that would be something that they would find palatable. I know twenty-three individuals uh, wrote that they would be willing to pay more taxes. Now, I don't know if they represent the thousands who make over that. I mean, I don't know if they're talking about 500,000 and over. Are they talking about single, uh, single events? If someone sells their businesses, is it another 3% on that? Is it just an ordinary income? What is it, what is it that would define what $500,000 is? Is it over a three-year period? What, what is it? So. The devil's in the details. We'll see what happens. But is that going to satisfy the need? And when when is the breaking point for some of them who have they have other choices? They don't have to stay here in Vermont. They can go to other states. They don't have to travel very far to to go to a, a state uh, that has no income tax. Could you see yourself supporting a comprehensive property tax reform measure that included? Uh, let's say an additional $50 million for the education fund in order to buy down the statewide property tax rate? I, there would have to be a, an awful lot of other things included in that. Uh, I propose a number of things over the last eight years that um, have not been given the light of day. So unless we're looking on the, the other side of the equation, if we're just talking about raising revenue, I'm, I'm not interested. It'd have to be coupled with some other significant structural changes in order to satisfy this in the future. Just putting putting more money is just putting another Band-Aid on. That's not going to fix anything. Governor, last Saturday, the uh, Windsor County Republican Committee changed leadership. They basically got rid of John McGovern, who's been a long time Republican. Uh, not identical to you, but kind of in the same mold. He doesn't think much of Donald Trump. Um, what does it mean for, this, for the state of the party that a guy like him isn't acceptable anymore? Yeah, I mean, I think that's what we're seeing uh, nationwide. And uh, I think it's uh, coming from the top, uh, the now, the now um, incumbent leader in some respects, um, who is um, using a philosophy of divide and conquer. And if you're not with me, you're against me. And he seems willing to cleanse the party in his term, his words. So I think it's, um, it's not healthy uh, for democracy in general. It's not healthy uh, for our state, because I think we, we desperately need more balance here in the state house. And, um, and it doesn't mean I don't think anyone, any one party should have full control. I think we get the best legislation when is a uh, you know, a balance uh, when we have a, an exchange of ideas in a civil and respectful manner. It, uh, I, I know you've largely absented yourself from party affairs, but when the Republican Party is divided and divisive and financially weak and structurally weak, uh, the last couple of cycles they put up a lot of non-competitive candidates for the legislature. Um, there's a good argument to be made that if the Republican Party were even just a little bit stronger or more inclusive, you wouldn't be facing supermajorities. Um, and, you know, if you run for re-election, um, 
the same thing might play out again this fall. Uh, what, what well, again, I've advocated publicly uh, for those who, um, I don't care if you're a Republican or, or an independent or a Democrat, if you're fiscally minded, uh, have common sense, willing to listen to different ideas, and, uh, and not, um, not and, and, and just and just be reasonable. Um, I would I would advocate for you to run for the legislature um, because we need more diversity in that respect. It seems like the party is driving out those people. Though. It um, again from the top, it appears that way. Um, but I would say there are a number of us who um, who feel that. Um, that respect and dignity and civility are just as important today or more important than ever. And we will continue to advocate for that. So I, uh, I do believe that, um, that there are a number of people who would, would maybe not publicly, but would say that they're Republicans. Um, but, um, but, you know, the, there's a tarnish to the party because of the, uh, the leader at the top. So. We'll see, we'll see what happens, but I'll continue to advocate for more common sense and fiscal reality. Governor, what do you think of uh, Bill Huff's get real approach? Are you familiar with that? I'm not. I, I know Bill Huff, but I'm not familiar with that. You know, in the past when you've been asked about recruiting more moderate Republican candidates, you've said um, it's not your job to rebuild the Republican Party in Vermont. Has that changed? I, I don't think so. In, I mean, in some respects, I, I'm advocating for more balance. Um, and I, I believe the balance comes from more uh, fiscal realism and uh, more common sense. People with a business background understand you know, how, to, how to balance a budget. I think that's, those are important qualities. And I think we're going to see more and more of that. I, I think from what I'm seeing and hearing and people writing to us, They've had enough. They can't take any more. And uh, I would advocate run for office. I mean, that's what, that's what got me to get involved with politics 20-something you know, years ago. It was just frustration with the legislature and what the direction they were going. So I thought I should get involved. And I hope people will do the same. Are you taking a more active role in that regard? I'm going to be active in trying to, to get more quality candidates, yes. Governor, can you return to the motel program, please? Do you know how much the state spent to stand up these four shelters? Yeah, I, I, don't, I don't have um, that at this point in time. Do you have a ballpark? I, I don't, I don't. We tried to use, uh, that was what was important about trying to use some of our own facilities. Uh, so we didn't have that expense. I know that there'll be expense uh, with the with the guard. Uh, we were able to work with the with the state of Connecticut uh, donated all the cots to us, so we were able to have like four or five hundred cots. Um, so I'd, it won't be dramatic, but there is a cost associated with it, no doubt. Are you confident that that cost is less than it would have cost to let folks stay in the motel pending their Well, we didn't operation? know, remember, we had no idea whether there was going to be, you know, 100 in each shelter or, as it turned out, sometimes zero. We had no idea. So um, per, um, I, I guess, yeah. I, if you take it per person at this point in time, it's going to be significant. If we had had 100, 100 people show up, then it wouldn't have been as significant. So it's hard to say at this point, but we'll be gathering those numbers. How many do you think will be coming back, will be wanting to continue in emergency housing of those, what, 400 or so? Uh, I have no idea. I mean, I don't, I don't know. Does uh, either Secretary Samuelson or Commissioner Winters have a figure for how many people have re-qualified for uh, GA housing? I, I do have that, Governor, if you'd like. Sure. Um, the, we have received, I think it was as of Friday, we had about 75 applications under the new disability variance form. And then as of this afternoon, 157 households 
uh, qualified under the new form or the form has been filed and we're processing those. Is Secretary Samuelson still on the line? Yes, most of the cabinet is. Um, it, Secretary, you mentioned that AHS officials were going door to door at some of the motels and knocking, trying to get people to apply for their waivers. How many AHS workers were doing that door to door knocking and reach out? Yeah, I can follow up and, and get to that. Um, we have them distributed across the state um, through our field services directors, and it was in uh, it was some of our contract staff, our field services directors, and uh, our community partners. So it was not a small effort. Um, they were able to reach out and contact uh, most of the individuals between Tuesday and Friday when the when the program changed. And if they weren't able to get in touch with someone, they were able to leave information um, there at the hotels under their doors. So I am am confident that we've made significant inroads in communicating with the clients that we serve. During what hours of the day was that outreach happening? Was it 24 seven or just during yeah. working hours? The majority of it was during working hours. They were able to get in contact with the majority of clients. Um, I can get back in touch with you with the details uh, through our field services uh, team um, on the non-work uh, non hours. Governor, uh, Commissioner Winters has described the, the four shelters that went up this weekend as an experiment. Would you say it was a successful experiment? As far as the, as far as setting up shelters in an emergency situation, uh, I think it was a su success. I think that we learned a lot and what we could do and what we're capable of doing. And again, I, I give great credit uh, to emergency management for leading this. Um, so, um, so from that standpoint, yes. From another standpoint, though? Well, I don't, I don't know. I mean, when you contemplate, when you have to set up homeless emergency shelters, uh, it's hard to to talk about success, right? Um, the, it, it sounds like you've been in touch with municipalities and they've told you that they don't, haven't seen an influx of hundreds of people on the streets suddenly after this weekend, and, but only a handful showed up to these shelters. Are you worried about them? Like, where are they? And are, are you concerned for these people? Um, you know, of course, we're concerned uh, about where they went, and it appears, though, they made other arrangements, which is is typical of what we've experienced over the last number of years. As I said, when I came into office, we didn't have a GA program that went for the whole winter like it is now. Um, it was all on adverse weather conditions. Um, so it was like every night during the winter, uh, you receive a call. Well, it looks like adverse uh, weather conditions are setting in. The hotel motel program is being uh, implemented, and and I, at at that point, after going through that for a year or two, I asked, well, why can't we do this differently? It just doesn't seem to give any certainty, especially to families uh, and the elderly. And uh, and I I asked what we could do differently. Now, that may have been a mistake in some respects, because that was a big, a big deal. We went from having, you know, a, a nightly type of provision, which with fewer people, but far less money as well, uh, to a program where we said we were going to make, have more certainty uh, for, during the months of, uh, of December. Uh, I think it was December 15th to March 15th. Um, and then a transitionary period on either end of that. So we developed that on our own. And again, this costs a lot of money, but it provided more certainty for families and, and those elderly with disabilities in particular. So I don't regret doing that, but uh, I know some would probably criticize that move and maybe say that that's what caused some of this. But the pandemic certainly had an effect on this afterwards. Uh, at caucus a week ago, Senator Bruce called out Republicans in general for not having solutions to to the uh, carbon. Was that was that discussion of his one of the motivators for this press conference? And I, I didn't I didn't go to that 
meeting. I, I don't have any knowledge of it, okay. so I'd say no. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Good job.